Hello, this video will talk about metabolism as well as redox reactions. So metabolism, as you see here, this is a term you've definitely heard of before, uh, but we have a really nice definition to go along with it, which is the sum of all chemical reactions that occur within a cell or organism. So a little blast from the past with your math days, sum is addition. So we're going to be adding all of the chemical reactions that happen in our body up together, and that's going to give us this term metabolism. So as I mentioned, you've seen the word metabolism before. A lot of times people associate metabolism with different types of eating patterns, maybe weight loss. A lot of things are associated with boosting or increasing your metabolism. And we'll talk about what that means and how that might be related to um, maybe weight loss and things like that. So before we get too deep into metabolism, I want to remind you all again about exergonic versus endergonic. So again, exergonic is going to be any time you see energy exiting. So any reaction you see ATP or other energy intermediates leaving or exiting, that is exergonic. On the flip side, any time you're going to see energy enter a reaction, we call that endergonic. So reactions, these chemical reactions that we'll be talking about Whenever it enters a reaction, that is known as being endergonic. So for our metabolism, some of these pathways work together, and frequently we kind of group them in what we call a metabolic pathway. So let's say A always happens first. Let me get my pen set up really quick. Let's say A happens, and then because A is there, B is there, then C is there, then D is there, right? So these pathways happen in a particular order. One thing that we've noticed is every time we go from one step to the next, we typically are going to use an enzyme. So as we go from A to B, we're going to use a particular enzyme. As we go from B to C, we're going to use a particular enzyme and so forth and so on. Because these reactions occur one before the other or we typically see them together, we always call them a coupled reactions. Um, you know what a couple is, right? Most time you see that with two people or a couple. Um, anytime you see two things together or reactions together, a lot of times we call them being coupled. One thing that you may frequently see coupled together is a reaction that is exergonic plus one that's endergonic. So think about an exergonic reaction. In that exergonic reaction, it is going to allow energy to exit. So my star is my energy in exergonics. It makes a lot of sense for an exergonic reaction to be very close to an endergonic reaction because that energy we created, it needs to enter, E-N, enter. So it makes quite a bit of sense biologically for a lot of our exergonic reactions to allow energy to exit in the form of the star and then that energy that has exited will then enter in endergonic. So they are coupled together. Usually if you find exergonics, you find endergonics. So as I mentioned, metabolism is a sum. So we're going to be adding two things together. And in this case, what we're adding together is catabolic or catabolism reactions plus anabolic or anabolism reactions. So metabolism is a sum, and it's a sum of molecules being built and molecules being broken. So the sum of building molecules up and also breaking them down. So to break them down, let's first talk with catabolism. Catabolism is whenever we break down molecules from something that's very large to something that's very small. So this good example would be like eating a sandwich or um, digesting any type of food, breaking it down. Typically, when we break this down, this is going to be exergonic. So energy is going to exit the reaction. Um, we're going to be producing energy as we break things down. That makes a lot of sense because, like I said, if you eat a sandwich, that's going to your body's going to break down that bread that you see here and allow you to um, create some type of energy that you can use. 
The reason I put a cat is because some people don't like cats and they think cats have kind of a negative energy. So right here you see the cat has broken something. So it's breaking things. So when you see the term catabolism, you see the cat in the first part of the word. A lot of people associate cats with breaking. So cat break, catabolism breaking. That might be something to help you. The second term is anabolism. So anabolism is where we start building something. So creating or making something from small to big. Whenever this happens, energy usually has to enter, right? Imagine if you wanted to build a house and you have some individual bricks. You need to put a lot of energy. You need to enter or allow energy to enter that reaction before you can build a big house, right? So anabolism is any time we have to build something. If you know where this is or what this is a picture of, it's a picture of Annapolis. So Annapolis has a lot of buildings. Anabolism building. Annapolis building, right? So trying to get you to come up with some type of system to kind of remember some of those terms. So I really like this diagram because it bridges together everything we've talked about so far. And you see here, this shows a large molecule which undergoes catabolism. So it breaks down, remember the cat? Breaks down from large to small. In this reaction, energy will exit. You see energy is leaving with this arrow exiting. In anabolism, energy first has to enter. You see energy is going in. It's a red arrow going into the reaction. And anabolism is where we're building something. So small to large, we are building. Annapolis buildings, right? Anabolism building. So this is kind of a nice picture to put everything together for you. So catabolism is very good for us. Um, one of the reasons it's very good for us is because we do not need any energy. So your body can do this while you're sleeping, while you're laying down, because you don't need any type of energy. This is where we digest or we break down molecules, right? It's taking something big and breaking it down to something small. Breaking down these molecules helps us to recycle monomers. If you remember earlier in the semester, a monomer is going to be, you know, one unit. So this is going to allow us to take something big, let's say a protein, add a protease, you see that ASE, that means it's an enzyme, and allow us to create small little individual amino acids, right? So it's taking some big protein or big word and breaking it down into, you know, smaller amino acids that we can use to then create other things. Along this process, we're going to actually be releasing energy, right? Because catabolism is exergonic. So it's exergonic, meaning we're going to be releasing energy along the way. As we release this energy, we tend to call the energy we release energy intermediates. So if you know what the word intermediate means, it means middle, right? Let's say you're in piano lessons, you can be in beginner lessons, intermediate, which is the middle, or maybe advanced, which is kind of the high one. Um, but a lot of the energy that we've released here, we can then use that energy we release to be able to contribute to endergonic reactions later where energy has to enter. So this is a great reason why catabolism is good for us. It's going to create energy here. So this is energy we're creating. And that energy we're creating can then be used in endergonic reactions later on. And then also it gives us all of these monomers and all of these smaller pieces we can use to build something up later. So let's say these are letters of the alphabet. You can use that to make brand new words, right? Um, because we were able to break them down. So this is why it's really, really important that we have things like digestion or th things like catabolism because we don't need any energy for it. It breaks down our molecules um, so that we can create other polymers down the line. And then it also is going to create energy that we can use to build up you know, these polymers along the way. 
So let's look at a very common reaction that we'll be studying in this module. Um, and this is photosynthesis. So we haven't covered it so far yet, but I want you to kind of be familiar with this formula because you're going to see it multiple times. And also this is one I want you to know. So I want you to get familiar with being able to recognize it. Um, you know, the different components that make it up as well as what each of the components role is in the photosynthesis process. So here you have six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of H2O, you add energy in the form of the sun. And then at the end of the process, you end up with glucose and six molecules of oxygen. So looking at this reaction, can you determine if it's anabolic or catabolic? and if it's endergonic or exergonic. So the answer is it is anabolic and endergonic. Why? Because the anabolism present here um, shows that we are building something up. So you're taking a small carbon dioxide molecule and you're building up a large glucose molecule. So I haven't drawn it for you, but it will look something really small uh, CO2, and then you're going to be building something that looks like this, right? A big, long six chain carbon with tons of oxygens and hydrogens on it and all kinds of stuff like that. Really, really big. Endergonic, because energy has to enter. Where? The sun. In the very beginning of the reaction, the sun has to give some energy so that you can take these really small bricks and build up this really big brick house right? That's how that works. If we're looking at cellular respiration, um, again, I want you to look at it from the left side. We have glucose molecule, six molecules of O2. Um, we then produce ATP. So you see on this side, we produced or made ATP. We also have six molecules of H2O, um, followed by six molecules of carbon dioxide. So looking at this reaction, is this anabolic or catabolic and endergonic or exergonic? If you guessed, or not guessed, if you knew it was catabolism and exergonic, you are correct. So the reason it's catabolic is because, again, cat breaking, we're breaking something down. You're taking this big, long, huge glucose molecule and breaking it into these small, tiny carbon dioxide molecules. It's exergonic because the energy is exiting. So you see the ATP here is leaving. The ATP is, is leaving out of the reaction as a result. So this is an example of exergonic in catabolism. Very interesting, I don't know if you've noticed, but these reactions are just the inverse of one another. So in photosynthesis, we have carbon dioxide and water, um, and energy are going to give you glucose and oxygen. In cellular respiration, glucose and oxygen will give you carbon dioxide, water, and energy. So it's really important that animals and plants work together because what we produce is what they need and what they produce is what we need. So it makes a great relationship. Again, showing this in just a visual way, this is a wonderful example of a coupled reaction in which photosynthesis is going to be endergonic and anabolic, and some of the products it produces, such as glucose and oxygen, our cellular respiration uh, process can use that. Because this process is exergonic and catabolic, it's gonna produce energy, and then some of its byproducts are carbon dioxide and H2O, which can then be used in photosynthesis, and as you see, it becomes a big circle, right? It's a really big cycle that occurs. So a closing thought I want to talk about are redox reactions. So if you look at the word, it's just a combination of the word reduction and oxidation. So you see uh, read, and then here you can see ox, right? Redox reactions. So in an oxidation, the first thing we see here is a loss of an electron. So think to yourself, what is the charge of something that loses an electron? If you said positive, you are right. So remember in our early days, 10 protons, you lose an electron, nine electrons, your overall charge is positive. 
Um, so anytime something has been oxidized, we call that, um, that means it has lost an electron and it has an overall positive charge. The complete opposite, if something has been reduced, it has gained an electron. So this is where we're in something that looks like this, in which you've gained an electron and the charge of that will be negative. So um, sometimes we refer to these as redox reactions in which you have one substance, let's say A with an electron, it loses that electron, it has been oxidized. And then on the bottom side, you have B. Uh, B is just sitting stationary, but then over time it gains an electron and in that case, it has been reduced. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit just to give you a better picture of what's happening. With the um, A, you see the A is being oxidized because on the left side, it has the electron. It lost the electron on the right side, it's oxidized. For the B on the left side, there is no electron. Once it goes to the reaction, it gains an electron. We call that being reduced. One great way to remember that is our friend named Leo. So Leo is a lion and Leo, the lion goes grr. So here Leo, the lion goes grr. Leo goes grr. So Leo lose electrons oxidation. Grr, the <laughs> roaring of the lion is gain electrons reduction. So this is a great way for you to remember what's happening if, if we ever talk about redox reactions. And our closing thought, or my closing thought, is substrate level phosphorylation. So what this means is that we can make ATP by using the substrates we have. So if you remember, enzymes can open and close to push substrates together. In this particular case on the left, our substrate has a phosphate group. So if you remember, ATP has three phosphates, ADP has two phosphates, right? So this ADP is missing a phosphate group. We want to make ATP. So on substrate level phosphorylation, we can form ATP by donating the phosphate group from the substrate to ADP to then create the very powerful ATP. So in this image here, I just want you to know substrate level phosphorylation occurs when our substrate is able to donate a phosphate group to create an ATP molecule. So you see you have an enzyme and a substrate. It still works like normal. You still have a you know, a brand new product, right? We will go from a circle to a square. Um, but in that process, one thing that happens is the substrate can give away one of its phosphate groups to then create ATP, which can go on to do many, many things. So I just want y'all to be familiar with this term because we will use it in cellular respiration. So finally, um, this is just a little bit of a review for you. Um, this is something you might be able to expect in, in some type of assessment format. Make sure you know what it means for something to be endergonic. What type of reactions occur? What type of delta G is present? What type of, uh, what does energy do? Does it enter? Does it exit? The same thing with exergonics. With catabolic reactions, what are examples of catabolic versus anabolic reactions? When do you see either one? Uh, what are some things that may be happening in these reactions? And then finally, reduction and oxidation. So making sure you understand what it looks like for something to be reduced or oxidized. So this is a great study tool here, making sure that you can write down everything that you know about these items, as well as think about scenarios in which you might see these items pop up. This concludes the presentation, and if you have any questions, please make sure to write them down, and we can talk about them in class.